Okay, so let me get started and welcome everybody to the fifth annual short course on parallel computing that we're having, that we've had here at Berkeley. And let me welcome both all of the folks who are here, who are, there are 130 signed up local uh, attendees and about 70 online. Now, the way that we're going to answer questions is that there's a website where people can type them in. That's all described there. And, but if you want to ask a question, by all means, feel free. If it's a short one, just go ahead and say it, and I'll repeat it so that the remote people can hear it and hear my answer, too. But if you have a longer question, then we have microphones. And so hold up your hands, and either uh, Mike or Costa will hand you a microphone, and you can ask your question that way. Okay, so let's get started. So I'm going to start out with the motivation and goals. I mean, the fact that you were willing to come here means you're already motivated, but let me just repeat some of that. And then there are several big events that have occurred in Berkeley in the last few years on which we are building the curriculum that I'm going to be teaching you today and that are making a big difference in the way people actually do parallel computing in the real world. So I'll tell you about Parlab and Aspire, two very large uh, projects and in research in, in computational science and, and parallel computing. And then there's a new graduate program that we started in Berkeley, uh, a graduate minor for PhD students who want to get a minor in computational science and engineering. There's a lot of work in that area at the neighboring billion-dollar Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. They have large facilities. In fact, they're providing the supercomputer that you will be using to do your homework in the hands-on session later today. And then the National Science Foundation is also involved in this. Many of the remote students are going to be doing their homework assignments on supercomputer accounts supplied for free by the National Science Foundation, which is also broadcasting a number of Berkeley courses. So then I'll tell you about the schedule and instructors, a little bit about the logistics, uh, you know, where we're going to be on the three days, and then I'll tell you about you, some statistics about the audience. So parallel computing is becoming ubiquitous. I mean, your laptop is almost certainly a multi-core machine. And so it's really the only way forward for the computing industry unless you never care about your programs running faster than they did in 2008. And so most people do care about that. And unfortunately, parallel programming is still harder than sequential programming, despite the best efforts of researchers at Berkeley and at many, many other places to make tools to make parallel programming easier. You still have to think a little bit differently than you do when you program sequentially. And that's what we're going to be telling you about, both the tools and the, and the different ways of thinking. And so we're still going to train you to think parallel. So here are some of those uh, events at UCB that I mentioned that are uh, on new activities for parallel computing. So about six years ago, Microsoft and Intel decided, you know, recognized this you know, trend that they were going to have to change everything they were going to do to become parallel. And they decided they wanted some input from a leading uh, academic research institution in the United States. So they put out a call for proposals, and all the leading computer science departments competed, and we won. And uh, we were one of the two winners. And so we had a, uh, a research uh, center established called the ParLab. And at the time, the words were multi-core revolution, everything becoming multi-core. But of course, now we have GPUs and cloud computing and all those other flavors that we'll be talking about as well. And in the meantime, many other large grants like the Amp Lab, uh, which is more about cloud computing, got funded here. And they're having their own boot camp next week. And then all good things come to an end. Our tradition at Berkeley is to have five-year projects. And so ParLab ended recently, and it's been replaced by Aspire, which is continuing a large part of the research agenda, but there's some new motivations I'll tell you about as well. Then there's a new graduate program, as I mentioned. And when I began to you know, ask the question, how many people on the campus, how many faculty, felt the need to train their students to understand this stuff, um, modeling and doing high-performance computing, 117 faculty from 22 departments signed up. So that's the traditional departments. You can imagine the science and engineering, but political science as well. So there's this need uh, across many disciplines to understand these things. Then, as I mentioned, uh, Exceed, is the, that's the NSF follow-on to the TerraGrid. That's the organization that used to organize access to all of NSF supercomputer centers. And they're broadcasting not just this course. They're broadcasting our one-semester version of this course. And uh, my colleague, Kurt Quartz, here is one-semester upper division parallel computing course and various other short courses as well. And as I mentioned, LBL does a lot of this work, and they're in the process of building a new building just a little bit uphill to house not just all the supercomputers that they buy on a regular basis and that you'll be using today and tomorrow, but also a bunch of interdisciplinary research teams to actually do this kind of work. 
So let me, we're going to teach you the basics. So here are the goals of the short course. We're going to teach you the basics about parallelism, including how to program. There's a hands-on lab. There are going to be two flavors that you get to choose from. I'll, we'll do the details later. So there are going to be tools that you can use now, go home and write parallel programs with some success, and then tools that we hope to build and ongoing research, because we've made a lot of progress in the last few years, and, but there's still a bunch of interesting open problems that I'll tell you about. So here is the PAR lab, and I'm going to tell you just enough about it to motivate the educational changes that it's led to in the way we teach parallel computing. There's a list of all of the different faculty, which range in departments from electrical engineering to mathematics to music. Music was part of the PAR lab. You'll see why. So the way we began thinking about parallel computing a number of years ago is we, looked, we talked to our friends in high-performance computing in science, and in particular, Phil Colella at LBL had who was familiar with many of the high-performance computing codes, recognized there were really only seven kernels, seven fundamental kinds of operations, out of which all of the high-performance programs at the Department of Energy were built. And here's a list of them in a rather funny format. And you'll see why in a moment. So there's operations on structured grids, like averaging with your nearest neighbors, linear algebra of various kinds, FFTs. So we knew about this list, this is going on seven years ago, and we said, okay, maybe that's enough for high-performance computing, but what about all, everything else that Silicon Valley needs to do? You know, all of the applications that Microsoft and Intel and many other companies are interested in. So we embarked on a research project where we took a whole bunch of different applications and we asked, what are they built out of? So we looked at high-performance computing, we knew they were built out of these seven, but we also looked at computer-aided design, machine learning, games, databases, spec benchmarks, embedded computing, we took apart the applications there and we asked, what are they built out of? What are the basic patterns that appear over and over again? And a little bit to our surprise, all those original six appeared, and seven appeared, the seven dwarfs, and only six more. And so here they are. So in addition to those scientific ones, there were, the new ones were finite state machines, circuits, dynamic programming, uh, backtracking branch and bound, graph algorithms, Graphical models is kind of a shorthand for certain kinds of machine learning algorithms. And so here is a heat chart of which kernel was most important in which application. And so red means it was used everywhere. So for example, dense linear algebra appears just about everywhere. It's sort of a basic building block. So matrix multiply being the canonical example. And, uh, but every one was used in an important way in some particular application. Yellow means a little less important, green a little less important. So, so uh, after we recognized that there were 13 of these, we asked, what are we going to call them? And we knew that there were still 13 dwarfs in The Hobbit, but we decided we had to change names because there's nothing magical about these numbers, so we, we renamed them the motifs or patterns. So in order to organize the PAR lab, what we decided to do was pick five leading applications that, were, that a lot of people cared about and decompose them into these patterns, into these motifs, and see if we could parallelize them effectively. So what did we choose? We chose an application from health, simulating the blood flow in the brain of a stroke victim. We chose image processing. This is a, a very commercial application. You say, here's a picture of my sister, here's a picture of her friend. Find me all the pictures where they're standing together, no matter how they're posed and so forth. Speech processing. You'd love your laptop to be able to do the following. You're in a lecture where somebody's speaking too fast, like me. You'd like it to, to make a, uh, a transcript of everything that I say, you know, with spelling corrections and so forth, so you can take notes later. So that's a, a speech application. Music, you'll hear about that later, quite literally. The very last lecture in this three-day short course will be a demonstration of some of the tools for music, both for composition and for broadcast. That uses a lot of high-performance computing. And browsers are a bottleneck, too. So you can see that uh, these cover, you can see where the red bars are. They use all of the patterns except uh, particle methods. So those, those really only come up in scientific computing, as far as we know. So, so actually, the list dropped here to 12. And so I said there were 13. So what happened to Monte Carlo? That was one of the original seven that was used in high-performance computing. So this is what happened. So in addition to these computational patterns, which appear over and over again, we have to ask ourselves, how do you put them together? How do you compose them to write bigger programs? A program doesn't just do linear algebra. It doesn't just do FFTs. It does lots of these things. So it turns out there's certain ways to glue them together in which you build bigger applications. And we asked what patterns appear to do that gluing, and that turned into something called our pattern language. So here are those original 12 computational patterns. And in addition to those, there are these structural patterns, which is how you glue them together. And there will indeed be a lecture on these. I don't expect you to read this slide right now. There is going to be a lot more material on it. 
And so what happened to Monte Carlo, it got renamed MapReduce, because that's really what it does. That's sort of the standard pattern, you know, which is with a much more popular name, which is how you do lots of embarrassingly parallel things and combine the results at the end. But there's lots of these other ones as well, and you'll hear about them later in a lecture. So as I said, th these are some of the main outcomes which affect education you know, very much as well as you know, practical everyday engineering life. And so that was the PAR lab. And then, as I said, all good things come to an end, and there's a new project who's called, whose name is Aspire. So we like to have good acronyms here. But let me say, so what is the motivation that's different in Aspire, which is still has to do lots of parallel programming, lots of those applications are still important. So when we started, the motivation was minimize the time to solution, right? Run faster. Now the application, now the motivation is minimize the energy. Because whether it's the battery in your laptop that you don't want to die, or whether it's the million dollars per megawatt per year that costs to run your supercomputer center, you care deeply about how much energy you use to solve the problem, not just how long it takes. And so the question is, how do you change your, you know, change your algorithm design and some hardware and everything else in order to minimize energy? And so we'll have a little bit to say about that, too. So those are the motivating projects. Let me now go on and talk a little bit about this graduate program. And some of you are graduate students, so I'm hoping to interest you in this. So as I said, there are 117 faculty from 22 departments who decided it was important to train their students in this. So I'm going to tell you how the designated emphasis works. I should say that that's Berkeley speak for minor. So you get, you're in a regular PhD program, and you take a few extra courses, and you have this minor on your transcript. We're also building, the faculty is building a bunch of new courses, and all the details are at that website. So as I said, this is a graduate minor. So when we started asking ourselves what the curriculum should be, we talked to the faculty and asked them what was their motivation. And there were two. The first motivation was that they had too little data. So for example, it might be too slow to collect the data. You can't wait for the climate to change to see what happens. You have to simulate it off into the future. It may be too expensive to collect the data. You want to build a chip. You can't afford to put it on the assembly line, build it, and see if it works. You have to be sure it works before you actually build it. That's done with simulation. Or it could be too dangerous, crash testing. So they need to do simulation. So that was one motivation, too little data. The other motivation was too much data. And that's because there are all these instruments out there which are collecting data at incredibly rapid rates of speed. So DNA sequencers, telescopes, the web for people doing social uh, uh, sciences. And actually, those simulations that we did to solve the first problem produce so much data, nobody can look at it. You have to use these machine learning tools and parallel computing in order just to look at the output from those big-scale simulations. And so we're addressing both of these needs. And so there's lots of people who are signed up from many different departments to do this. And there's lots of opportunities for collaboration because not one person usually understands the entire stack of techniques. And so we try to build teams, not just among different departments and different graduate students on campus, but across campus and at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. There are a lot of world experts up there. I'll tell you more about them later. So how does a graduate student participate? You, you, know, you start in a PhD program. You're already here, so you've been accepted into a PhD program. There's a short list of courses to take. You have to learn a bit about computer science, a little bit about applied math or statistics, depending on your interest, and then some applied area where you take that stuff and use it to solve a real problem. So there's course requirements. Then your qual should have a little bit about this material in it. Your thesis should have some aspect of computational science and engineering. And when you graduate, you get your PhD in whatever, astronomy, political science, with a designated emphasis, a minor, in computational science and engineering. So just to show you the breadth, I'm going to flash two slides up, which is just a list of all the participants uh, in alphabetical order by department, so the astronomy department, bioengineering. And there are two numbers. The red number is the number of faculty who signed up from that department. And the blue number, which is pretty out of date now, is the number of courses that are available that are relevant to this. And so you can see that you know, there are a lot of courses. And there's no surprise that EECS has the most faculty involved here and a large number of courses that are involved. But uh, let me just go on to the second slide. Here's the, the second of the two slides. But it also includes public health, political science. So, so what are the political science applications? Well, no surprise, they have large databases of sociological information that they want to you know, interpret so they can say, how do people behave? But they also do agent-based simulation of crowds. They, they build little programs that simulate people's decision making and in very large numbers try to you know, estimate how large groups of people make decisions. So that's yet another example. So what are the main courses that deal that, you know, that are part of the requirement? One of them is the one semester version of what you're sitting in now at CS267. It is, and it's offered every spring. 
and all the lectures are freely available on the web. And we have taught it before as a, uh, as a joint course and uh, with, with other universities. So the instructor was here. There were remote instructors at these other universities who gave credit. So you took the course you know, at Davis or Santa Cruz. And we're trying to repeat that now because the course has, has been adopted by the National Science Foundation. They started broadcasting it for free nationwide last spring with uh, computer accounts at, at their supercomputer centers. We built auto graders so that remote students can get feedback immediately on how well they did their homework. I think you'll be using the auto graders here too for, to give you feedback on your assignments. And we invited this time instructors from other schools to come here so we could teach the teachers so that they could be instructors at their universities next spring, perhaps, so that, so that people could get real grades. I mean, this is one of the debates about online education, right? You get a certificate. The certificate says that someone who claims to have your name claims to have done the homework, right? What value is that? You really want a, you know, a, a course certificate from your school that you get real credit, and we're hoping to scale this up this way. So let me give you some examples of projects that people have done in the past on this. So these are some class projects, and all their posters and video presentations of the students are on the web. The first one is uh, content-based image recognition. So that's the one I told you about. Find me all the pictures of, that have this person, this other person standing together in some pattern. So that's a very natural one. Uh, the next one was from a biology student. It was faster molecular dynamics. The question was, how does this uh, um, compound called amyloid beta peptide change because people believe that's, you know, it, it glues to your neurons and causes Alzheimer's disease, so they want to simulate that quickly. Uh, better speech recognition uh, through a faster inference engine, so how do you uh, parallelize the machine learning that goes on in recognizing speech? Uh, these huge new genome sequencers that generate too much data, they also have very large error rates, so how do you tolerate errors when you try to, you know, sequence the genome based on your you know, short segments which have a lot of errors in what uh, genes they have in them. Uh, there was another biology student who was simulating uh, uh, e an ecological simulation, the zooplank zooplankton population at the bottom of the ocean. So the next one was a, uh, an undergraduate uh, project because there are a number of under very clever undergraduates who take this course every year and their motivation was you're standing there with your cell phone, you're trying to play a game on it, you don't have much bandwidth, it's not a very good experience, but you're standing next to your friend, your friend has a cell phone and bandwidth, maybe you can share it and parallelize the game across the two cell phones and get double the bandwidth or triple or whatever. So that was an interesting one. And uh, so, so you can imagine that might have commercial implications. So in fact, back in the year 2000, one of, when I taught the course then, one of the uh, class projects was some sort of parallel web search engine. It seemed like an embarrassingly parallel application at the time. But at the end of the semester, the student went and talked to his advisor, Eric Brewer, and they went off to talk to some venture capitalists. And uh, they made a few hundred million out of it. So, but, I, but I make sure to tell students, you don't have to you know, become millionaires in order to get an A in the course. It's perfectly all right just to do a good project. And uh, we also have had students from the Haas Business School. And, and so what is their interest in this? The question is, which industries are going to be impacted by parallel computing or more ready to become more productive because of the way they've organized their businesses as opposed to others? So uh, this student did a study using business data on how companies are organized to say which ones are ready to go. So those are sample class projects, and there are many, many more on the web page. So we are also putting together a bunch of new courses and the first one starts tomorrow. Uh, it's another boot camp. It's Python for Science. And so if you get tired of me, you can go listen to Josh Bloom. And he also has a one semester seminar on how, how to do high performance computing using uh, programming at the Python level and which tools are available lower down. There's another one which uh, is designed specifically for non-computer science graduates and undergraduates. I, I can best describe it as, well, it's software engineering for scientific computing. But it's what you sh all sh if you're not a computer scientist, it's what you needed to know if you'd been a computer scientist undergraduate in order to build big software systems in an effective way so that you can do your big, build your big science simulations. And that's taught by Phil Colella. And then we have lots of other ones which are more specific to particular departments, so mo better mo molecular simulation, um, better uh, earth science simulation, and then optimization of various kinds. And these are generally use very high-level tools like MATLAB, so they're not designed to be high performance. The question, and then you, know, you would take a course like this, CS267, in order to figure out what are the algorithms that lie underneath this to make them go faster. So that finishes talking about that graduate program. I also just want to say a little bit about the billion-dollar laboratory that's next door, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which has a huge uh, 
investment in high performance computing and will supply some of the resources. So they run a supercomputer center. They have 4,500 users. There's 600 large projects going on. And there's, there's 1,500 refereed publications per year. And it was the key to two recent Nobel Prizes. The 2011 one was Saul Perlmutter, uh, who, was, who discovered why the universe is expanding at the rate that it is. And the other Nobel Prize in 2007, well, it wasn't physics. It wasn't chemistry. What do you think it was? It was peace. That was the climate simulation Nobel Prize, where people you know, collected all the information from climate modeling and did various predictions. And so it, they used the facility up there quite a bit, too. So you're going to be doing your homework on Hopper. That's a 1.3 petaflop machine. A petaflop is 10 to the 15th floating point operations per second, so it's quite fast. It's the 11th fastest computer in the United States. When they first installed it about three years ago, it was the sixth fastest. People build these machines regularly, so it's, every machine falls down the list. And there's a new machine on order, but it's not installed yet. There are a lot of other facilities they have here. As I mentioned, you're going to be using Hopper, which is 6,000 compute nodes. Each node is multi-core. So there's a total of 153,000-way parallelism. You'd be using Hopper, which is 6,000 compute be using Hopper, which is 6,000 compute to be using Hopper, which is 6,000 compute to be using Hopper, which is 6,000 compute be using Hopper, which is 6,000 compute to 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 be using Hopper, which is 6,000 compute. 